Okay, so we're going to talk about human herpes viruses. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six human herpes viruses will be worth our attention. So these are among the largest human viruses. In terms of the size of the genome, they are the biggest. Cytomegalovirus is the biggest genome. They are enveloped, and they have double-stranded DNA genome. OK? That makes sense. So in order to understand how herpes viruses work in general, we're going to very briefly discuss the process of infection. And it's useful because it's going to introduce some concepts um, just relevant to virus infections. Let me draw a big ass cell. So this is a cell. Okay. Now, I'm going to use red to designate all the stuff relevant to the virus, okay? So, I am not going to properly represent the actual structure of the herpes virus. All I want to show is that there is there's a particle, okay? And inside of that particle, we have a genome. So far, it makes sense? So what should happen first for the virus, for a virus, to infect a cell? virus has to bind to the receptor. And if there is no receptor, virus can't infect the cell. Does that make sense? For instance, like going off the rails with, pol with, with herpes, you cannot infect mice with polio. Because mice don't have a receptor for polio. You see what I'm saying? If receptor is very, very specific, then, you know, if it's not present, virus can't infect. It uh, turns out herpes viruses are uh, quite promiscuous. This is an official term. Promiscuous virus means that it uses some receptor that is commonly found in many different cells. Okay? Especially in, in the experimental settings in the lab, Herpes virus can infect almost everything. In human body, it's slightly different. You know. So far, we're good. So it binds to the receptor and then enters the cell. Now, inside the cell, the whole particle thing, the envelope and the capsid, it gets, I mean, not, okay, destroyed. All right, let, let's do destroyed. It's not really destroyed, fall apart, okay? Releasing the DNA. Now, uh, quite frankly, the presence of DNA in the cytoplasm, let me ask you a simple question. The DNA in, in, in the human cell, where is it supposed to be? Yeah. So if it's in the cytoplasm, this is, you know, this is fishing, right? For the cell, it's fishing. means it's not good. So herpes virus DNA rushes itself into the nucleus. And it, it ends up in the nucleus where, where you already have human DNA, right? So brown is human stuff. What happens to herpes virus DNA in the nucleus? Everything that happens to a normal DNA, you know, like adult DNA in the nucleus, it gets transcribed into RNA. RNA is transported into cytoplasm, so we can say, okay, it's DNA. Viral DNA gets transcribed to RNA. RNA gets out and, you know, ribosomes, right? So, the result of it is a bunch of virus proteins. Nothing complicated here. That make sense? These proteins eventually assemble 
into proper particles, packaging the DNA inside. Okay? And virus leaves. So that's your general life cycle of a herpes virus. Okay, so virus binds to the receptor, gets in the cell, DNA ends up in the nucleus, genes being expressed, viral DNA is copied multiple times, virus assembles into the particles with the proper DNA and just gets out of the cell. Make sense? Everybody? Good? This is your acute infection. Like this is something, when you have a cold sore on your lip, this is what happens. But what is interesting about herpes viruses, they can establish what is called a latency. When immune system starts to bend down the virus infection blocking it, okay, <coughs> virus enters the state of latency where its DNA circularizes and exists. This is called episomal form. Okay. Um, why I think it is important. I came across the wrong representation of herpes viruses in, in books, like in microbiology textbooks, where the textbook says, oh, and viral DNA gets incorporated into human DNA. No, it does not. It doesn't get incorporated into human DNA. I want to do justice to the virus and don't portray it as some evil thing, okay? That makes sense? So it exists as episomal form. So this is something, one of the features of herpes viruses that make them kind of unique, okay? So if you, when you get exposed to herpes virus, when you get infected, okay? Herpes virus, um, unlike true love, is going to stay with you forever. Okay, in the latent form. So latency is one of the features. It's not the only feature. Now, if it's latent, it can get reactivated. When your immune system is down from stress, from other infections, virus can get reactivated and cause acute infection again. When your immune system, so reactivation is totally possible. When your immune system goes back to normal, it bangs down on the virus, you know, shuts it down like a whack-a-mole, and, and that, that's it. No more replication. We good? Is that understood? Herpes viruses are one of the oldest human viruses. So they were with humans for like, I don't know what, how many years. Which explains why, in general, infections with different herpes viruses are relatively mild. If you would look like across the board, stuff that is unusual to humans like Ebola, it's pretty bad. Okay? Look at coronavirus. Yeah, it's pretty bad. The stuff that's been with humans for for years, like herpes, eh, it's okay. It's not too bad. So there are three um, herpes virus types, generally speaking. And the first one that we're going to talk about is going to be alpha herpes viruses. So there are three viruses in that category that I wanted to mention. Herpes simplex virus 1, herpes simplex virus 2, and chickenpox. What's common between all three alpha herpes viruses is that they become latent in neurons, in different neurons, but in neurons nonetheless. Okay, so what is HSV1? It's cold source. Okay, that's your cold source on the lip, and that happens like. I had cold sores since I remember myself. Like, seriously. Infection with herpes viruses usually, especially HSV1, usually happens early in life. And by the age of 55 to 60, almost 100% of population are positive. 
Now, HSV2 causes what's known as genital herpes, which, in my absolutely personal opinion, but I don't really understand what is the big difference, like, what is the, like, it's not more shameful than having cold sores. We just tend to shame everything that's associated with genitalia, but quite frankly, throat, stomach, or genitalia, there's not a lot of difference between them, like biologically. Does that make sense? So basically, cold source, but on genitalia. That's all. Um, <coughs> the prevalence, there were a couple of studies on the prevalence of HSV2, and it shows that, you know, like 20, 30 percent, which I really like tongue in cheek, I want to ask the question. If you ask people, do they have genital herpes, do they really tell you? Um, so, important thing about this stuff, cold sores and genital herpes are going to be manifestations in people who are otherwise healthy. If you get someone severely immunocompromised, like severely immunocompromised, uh, HSV1 and HSV2 may lead to encephalitis, and herpes encephalitis is very, very, very bad almost uniformly lethal, okay? Another thing about herpes is vertical transmission from mother to child. Neonatal herpes is awful. It is a very severe disease for an infant and usually if an infant survives herpes, there are consequences like mental disabilities, motor disabilities, all, all, kinds, of, all kinds of troubles. That makes sense. Chicken pox. Uh, well, the virus is called varicella zoster. Okay. Uh, very infectious virus. Uh, unlike other herpes viruses, actually, I didn't put this up here. Uh, all of them are transmitted by bodily fluids. We never mentioned that. So all of them are transmitted by bodily fluids. Um, chicken pox is also respiratory transmitted. Okay. I mean, I don't think I really need to describe what chicken pox is. Everybody knows that. Um, the problem comes when you have chicken pox as a child and you recover. As far as I've heard, I never had chicken pox. At least I never had like manifestations. Um, as far as I know, it's pretty crappy. Okay, but you get better, you recover, you're fine. But then when you get older, your immune system starts to. It's called um, what's, what's the fancy word? Senescence. But basically, your immune system gets old and weak. Okay, and the virus usually gets latent gets the latency in the neurons of the spinal nerves, mostly thoracic uh, region, and people start to get flare-ups of shingles. So basically same virus replication but in the skin. Painful, I, not necessarily only skin can be in the eyes actually, basically any epithelium pretty bad. So this is why we give people not, so we, we give kids chickenpox vaccine, that's important, we do have a vaccine and it's a good reason your child won't be particularly happy if they end up with shingles. Um, but we also give shingles vaccine to elderly people. And this is, well, elder, I shouldn't say elderly. I know some of those, no, not people over 55. Let's put it this way, people over 55, okay? So basically, for instance, I never had a vaccine. I never had chicken pox. I was exposed pretty darn well to people with chicken pox. Like, there is no chance virus didn't get into me. Could I have an asymptomatic infection? Absolutely I could. Okay? Um, what does that mean for me? It means that in like 13 years, I'm going to go to the doctor's office and ask them for shingles vaccine. So my immune system gets a boost and keeps, you know, chicken pox that I definitely have undercover. 
kind of keeps banging on. That makes sense? Um, other than that, I mean, there are some hospitalizations, in immunocompromised, and it can cause encephalitis, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Okay. Any questions? Okay, good. Uh, second beta herpes virus, uh, there's going to be only one that we're going to chat about, is cytomegalovirus or CMV. I mean, it's kind of nothing, really. I mean, it, it, it gets more interesting, but usually this virus is acquired in, in the childhood uh, by sharing various bodily fluids. Kids are particularly good at it. And usually there are no symptoms. Maybe a bit of a cold. Maybe a very, very light kind of mononucleosis-like illness. Very light. And that's it. And then you live a happy life and there's, there's nothing. There are some studies and for five years I was studying the role of cytomegalovirus in the cardiovascular disease. And even I am kind of skeptical. <laughs> so, and I was studying it. So uh, maybe it increases the chances for atherosclerosis. There is some association. There is some association between cytomegalovirus infection and glioblastoma, brain tumor, which is by itself very rare. But a couple of things that are really interesting. So first of all, CMV is a leading cause of kidney transplant failure, kidney transplant failure. Not because of the rejection, but for a different reason. If a donor is CMV positive, are you with me? When kidney gets into recipient, recipient is immunosuppressed to not reject, which automatically creates a perfect environment for this guest virus that came with the kidney. Does that make sense? And this virus starts to replicate like crazy in basically in the blood vessel. And when it replicates in the blood vessel, that we know, it causes inflammation and eventually stenosis of the blood vessel. Blood supply to the kidney drops, hypoxia, kidney's gone. Okay, so this is why now all the donors are tested for CMV. Um, second big thing, really big thing about CMV is neonatal infections. It's vertically transmitted. And the worst part, like with herpes, I mean, you at least can see that, right? If, if, if somebody has general herpes or labial herpes, mother can at least see the symptoms. With CMV, there are no symptoms. Virus can be actively replicating, and it, it is, by the way, it's latent in, in, in monocytes, okay? So virus can be actively replicating in, in your macrophages, in your tissues, and you're going to have no symptoms whatsoever. And it drips down to, to, to a child, and I saw photographs of newborns with CMV. It is really, really hard. Most of them don't leave. It's bad. So this is why, for it, kind of paradoxically, there is a pretty large effort to make a vaccine against CMV to prevent that vertical transmission. Although, kind of, you know, it's not such a big problem. And kids who survive neonatal CMV, in overwhelming majority of cases, there's some significant, there, there's serious consequences. Uh, m most benign, probably, uh, loss of hearing, and it progresses to, to cognitive disabilities and motor disabilities of all, all, all kinds. That makes sense? Now, the third kind are gamma herpes viruses. You probably could predict that already. So, two that I wanted to mention here are Epstein Barr virus, EBV, and what was that? Oh, Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus. So, I'm going to start with this actually KSHV, Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus. First two letters refer to Kaposi is the last name of a guy 
sarcoma is cancer. Okay. This virus causes an interesting, unique form of skin cancer. Now, who is it risk? This virus is a hallmark disease of patients with AIDS. Okay. And we're going to talk more about patients with AIDS, but if you are if you're working in the hospital and you see a patient who in addition to symptoms like diarrhea and uh, shortness of breath uh, has purple blotches on the skin, that's KSHV, that's Kaposi sarcoma. It's very, very characteristic. That make sense? Now what about Epstein-Barr virus? It is named after two physicians. I think Barr was definitely French. Epstein, either British or American. They just dis discovered EBV in Africa. Uh, it is a causative agent of infectious mononucleosis. Mono. <coughs> now, I'm lucky, never had it. From what I've heard, it's not the most pleasant experience. So the virus it infects B cells and epithelial cells. So infection of epithelial cells explains all the respiratory, you know, like uh, hard to swallow and inflammation in the throat, blah, blah, blah. Infection of B cells later progresses to latency. When it infects B cells, um, causes massive inflammation in the lymph nodes and lymph nodes enlarge. But there are two conditions that are associated with EBV that are pretty bad. Uh, later in life, Epstein, latent Epstein-Barr virus infection may lead to nasopharyngeal carcinoma or Burkitt's lymphoma, cancers. And now, more and more studies point to the fact that EBV may not directly cause cancer, but contribute to the cancer development and even synergize, like work together with human papillomavirus. That makes sense? So it was shown that often that basically among patients with head and neck cancer, uh, the frequency of EBV and HPV is much higher than in the general population. Good? Any questions on gammas? Now I'm going to tell, tell you some, some real, real cool story, not for the exam, but it, not the anecdote, really interesting story. So, everybody knows the condition known as Alzheimer's. Right? I'm actually going to cut it short here. 